It's so good to have all of you with us, and especially those that are joining us on the uh, computer as well as at home. Happy Mother's Day. It's so good to have everyone in worship today. Well, I want to spend a little time this morning talking a little bit about Proverbs in general. And, and although the Proverbs are, are known mostly as the writings of Solomon, we know that from a historical point of view that Solomon is not the only one who's actually written Proverbs. In fact, the Proverbs were written by men who were wise counsel, so to speak, who had come before the king and who would come before others to give words of wisdom. They were like sages and, and wise persons in the midst of that. Now, Solomon, we know that when we look at 1 Kings chapter 4, that probably about 3,000 Proverbs can be associated with Solomon. But we also know that there are other Proverbs that were written by these wise persons, these sages, that actually occurred during the, the time that King Hezekiah was king. Now, when you look at our Jewish friends and they begin to talk to you, they'll say that, that the writings are actually based upon a couple of things from the Jewish perspective, and that is that the writings of the Torah, there are the writings of the prophets, and there are the writings of what's called the wisdom writings. And those wisdom writings is where we find the Psalms, we find Job, we find Ecclesiastes, we find Proverbs. And it was in those wisdom writings that the writers had the great emphasis of trying to draw the person into a deeper sense of what godly wisdom was all about. So we know that it holds a lot of credibility <coughs> excuse me, in, in what they were trying to deal with. Now, the priests and the prophets dealt a lot with the religious matters, but it was these sages and these wise persons, so to speak, that took it to a different level to make sure that every day that we would have the foundation that is needed to live a wise life in the eyes of the Lord. Now, Proverbs were primarily written for the following reason. Prudence to the simple, knowledge and direction to the young, and to make people wiser. So isn't it kind of cool that, that God thought about all of this in advance and said, I'm going to give you a book in, in my book of salvation called the Bible. I'm going to give you a place where you can go because I have guided, I have directed, and I have called upon these writers to give you writings of wisdom. So it's really neat, and we need to understand that everything that we need to know how to deal with a situation in life is found in God's holy scripture. And it's not found on the bookshelves of the self-help ads or magazines or those things. All we have to do is open the scripture. And in the midst of that scripture, we know that God is moving within us. Well, Proverbs 31 talks about a, a special woman. In fact, it says that the word is not just special, but a woman of what they call of noble character. Now, when I think of the word noble, the thing that comes to my mind is, is a person that has like a pedigree, a person that is born within a family <clears throat> that has royalty or something of that nature. But in reality, what the proverb writers are trying to say is that a woman of noble character is a woman who has identified herself with a deep level of servanthood. So what we read in Proverbs 31 are writings about women, or a woman, so to speak, and women in general, who have given their lives to a deep sense of servanthood in the life of their family, but more importantly, in the life of the Lord. Now, some of you might look at this and say, well, well the words of Proverbs 31 are exact words and nothing should be done to doubt, deal with that. Some of you look at it from an allegorical point of view, and you say that it's part of just a wisdom piece of literature that's written to give just some interesting things about that. And, and whether you believe one or the other, you know, I think there's room for both in that, that, that it, is, it is specific in talking about what it means to have noble character as a woman, but also there's some allegory that's in that, in a sense that the way it's written leads us to believe that from a liturgy point of view or from a literature point of view, that it's, it's even deeper from the perspective of dealing with who we are as, as human beings. Now, a couple of things before we get started. Obviously, today is Mother's Day, and, and, and I realize that in, in thinking about Mother's Day that, that this day is actually filled with a lot, of, a lot of emotions. Now, some come to church and some deal with Mother's Day in general thinking about their mothers who have died and gone on to glory, and that can be somewhat upsetting. Some of you on Mother's Day, maybe you're a, a woman, a mom, who's thinking about a child, your child, who has died. And, and that brings about a, a sense of grieving that comes with that too. Some of you are, are thinking about Mother's Day in a term that, that you're thinking about how, 
you were, were kind of ignored as a child and maybe that you weren't even wanted. And, and to think about Mother's Day and that mother figure, that mother person that, that did that to you isn't very affirming in that point of view. Maybe you've been trying to have children of your own and medically it's impossible and, and no matter how many times you, you've gone back to the doctor, you have discovered it's just not, <coughs> excuse me, it's just not going to happen. Some of you have found out that you've become estranged from your mothers. And, and by being estranged from your mothers, you, you haven't made contact or you haven't written or you haven't emailed or you haven't gone to visit. And, and that relationship is strained. But, but you know what I found out? That, that for a lot of us, when we have estranged relationships with the things that we see, we realize that all it takes is to pick up a phone and make a phone call. And that by making a phone call, we can, we can know that, that, that we can pull that together. Maybe you're a single mom. Thank you, Bonnie. Maybe you're a single mom, and, and you're at a point in your life where you're thinking about how hard it is to raise a family, to pay the bills, to keep the roof over your head, to, to think about college, and it's just like a never-ending battle. And sometimes as single moms, maybe we get a little fried, so to speak, because we're just thinking about all of that stuff that's on us. Well, these are things that happen a lot of times in creating an awareness about Mother's Day. But let me tell you something real quickly here. 365 times it's listed in the Bible, these two words, fear not. Say that with me, fear not. You know, God says fear not. If that's what's all going on with you, fear not. Because the significant thing is that you can find joy on Mother's Day, whether you're a mother or whether you are a woman who's been a mother figure or a woman who's had a tremendous influence in the lives of so many of us, you have something to be grateful for on this day called Mother's Day. Well, we thought we'd do something. We thought we would reach out to the children and youth into our church and to talk to a couple of them and ask them, what does it mean to you to have mom? And, and this video is going to show you some things as to what it is that they had to say. My mom is the best mom ever because she buys me toys and games and she loves me and she's very nice. My mom is awesome because she helps with schoolwork and she just cares for me. Because she's nice. My mom's the best mom because she's the person that I talk to all the time and she's my best friend. My mom's the best mom because she hugs me a lot. She is always wonderful and caring and she always knows how to make me in a good attitude. My mom's the best mom because she's so nice and she always lets me go over to my friend's house and lets them have sleepovers. Because she does a lot of things for me. She drives me places. She also is pretty much my shoulder to cry on. When I get off track, she puts me back on track. My favorite thing about my mom is that she's just awesome. She's really nice and caring. My favorite thing about my mo mom it, is that, that she always loves me. Uh, my favorite thing about my mom is she's the same size as me, so we can share clothes. <laughs> she's always there for me when I need her. I love you. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day, and I love you. I love you, and thank you for doing everything you do for me. Happy Mother's Day. I love you. You're the best. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day! How neat is that to, to, to hear from our kids what it means to them to have moms? Well, you know, the Bible is, is full of so much imagery about Mother's Day and especially about mothers in general. And it, and it talked about significant mothers. You know, Moses' mother was Egyptian, and she actually broke Egyptian law because of the love that she had for her son Moses so that she could train him and raise him up with a Hebrew heritage of his fellow people. We also know that the mother of James and John, she loved her boys so much that she even went and said to Jesus, I, I, I want you to have them at your right and your left in the kingdom of heaven. And we look at Naomi. Naomi loved Ruth, and Ruth was a Moabite woman. And even though that Ruth was Naomi's daughter-in-law, when, when Naomi's son died, uh, she took Ruth under her wing and continued to be in ministry to her. And because of that, she 
turned her into being a woman of the one true God. And through that, the lineage of Ruth came King David, ultimately leading, as, it's, as we find in Matthew's gospel, to Jesus himself. Yeah, so, so as we survey these words of Proverbs 31, specifically 10 through 31, I think they parallel for us a lot of the attributes of what we see in the life of Christ himself. And I want to highlight a couple of those for you this morning because I think it's important for us to know that, that we also have these attributes in us. And ladies, women, you have them in you. And the question is, what can we do together to, to mold those and to come out as greater persons of influence? The first one is a mother loves through sacrifice. A mother loves through sacrifice. Sacrifice is an interesting word, and when you think of the word sacrifice, what it means is that you're going to put the needs, you're going to put the desires, you're going to put all of the things of what others want before yourself. That's what sacrifice means. Sacrifice means if I want something, if I'm going to do something, if I'm striving for something, if someone else has a need, I'm going to put my own desire, my own ego, my own stuff aside, and I'm going to fulfill what it means to sacrifice or to give to someone else. There's a story of a lady by the name of Amy Hawkins. In April 7th of 2006, her life changed dramatically. Uh, she was on her phone with her husband, Jared, at the time. Her husband, Jared's a firefighter there in, in the county in Tennessee where they live. And Jared was saying, we just got up on the weather radar that there's a tornado somewhere near our home. And his wife, Amy, said, I know, it's here. And then the phone went dead. For 45 minutes, he tried to reach Amy on the phone. Jared called and called and called, and he was trying to find out not only how his wife Amy was, but their then two younger sons, Cold and Jared Jr. And all of a sudden, a call came back from the neighbors, and the neighbors said, Jared, you've got to come home. A great tragedy has happened. We found the children. They're, they're not uh, badly harmed, but Amy, it doesn't look good. So he drove home as quickly as he could to get there, and they said that as they began to look through the rubble, the first time they couldn't find Amy and the two children. And then a second look later, they found them. They were hidden under some of the rubble, and they were able to break the children free. And as they were doing that, they noticed that Amy's arms were wrapped around them, using her body to shield them from all of the debris that was falling that day because of the tornado. Well, as the debris began to fall and as it fell upon her, it cracked her skull and it, and it severed her spine. And she is unable to walk from the waist or unable to move from the waist down. And she begins to think about what little bit she remembers of that day. And even today, she says, I still have these dreams that one day, one day I'll walk again. And I see myself running the bases with Cole. And I see myself kicking the soccer ball with little Jer. And one day, just because I, not just because I want to do it, but because they want me to do it too. And one day I know I will. And she said, don't think of me as any kind of hero. I did, any, I did exactly what any other mother would do. Mother's loves, love comes out of sacrifice. A mother also loves through a word called wisdom. And, and again, we see the wisdom in some of this writing. And, and some of those sayings of what our mothers say to us about wisdom, you probably heard pastors preach on that in the past. Like moms say to us, wear clean underwear because you never know if you're going to be at the hospital. You know, those words of wisdom that come. Well, I thought I would turn this around a little bit, and, I'd, and let's look at kind of thinking through what some of the biblical moms would have said to their children that we know that are main people from, from the Bible. So let's look at the top 10 list of what biblical moms would have said to their kids. Number 10, Samson, get your hand out of that lion's mouth. You don't know where it's been. <laughs> Number 9, David, I told you not to play in the house with that sling. Go practice your harp. We pay good money for those lessons. <laughs> Number eight, Abraham, stop wandering around the countryside and get home for supper on time for a change. Number seven, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, leave those clothes outside. You smell like a dirty old furnace. <laughs> Number six, Cain, get off your brother. You're going to kill him someday. <laughs> Number five, Noah, no, you can't bring them in. I told you, quit bringing strays home all the time. <laughs> Number four, Gideon, have you been hiding in that wine press again? Look at your clothes. I'm never going to get those stains out. Number, number three, James and John, 
No more burping contests at the table. Friends are going to start calling you sons of thunder. <laughs> I love this one. Number two, Judas, have you been going through my purse again? <laughs> and the number one of the top ten list of what mothers would say of biblical times to their children, Jesus closed that door. What do you think? You were born in a barn? You see, God, God gave mothers, God gave wisdom, God gave wisdom to, to uh, women of influence that's uncanny words of wisdom. God said, gave them the mouth to be able to speak. God gave them the heart. God gave them the mind. And through that, you and I have been influenced in such a powerful way. I was talking a little bit earlier about, about Ruth and how Naomi, her mother-in-law, was a great influence. And there's a book in the Bible called Ruth in the Old Testament, and it actually is one of our wisdom writing, writings as well. And Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, came to her, and even after her son died, she came alongside of her daughter-in-law, Ruth, and would not cast her away and would not move her out into another home, but began to reach out and to minister to her. Why? Because Ruth was actually a Moabite woman, and Moabites served and worshipped a God that actually slew young children as sacrifices. So Naomi reached out and ministered to Ruth, and through that, Ruth's life was changed. And we see a huge relationship, like I said, that ultimately led into the lineage of David all the way into Jesus. So a mother's words of wisdom have power. Let's go back to verse 26 in Proverbs 31. It says, she speaks with wisdom. An unfaithful instruction is on her tongue. She speaks with wisdom. Faithful instruction is always on her tongue. The Apostle Paul took note of this. And Paul later on in history took notice of the influence that women had on the lives of others. And Paul saw some gifts and some talents and some qualities in a young man by the name of Timothy. In fact, Paul loved Timothy so much, he called him his spiritual son. Paul didn't have any biological children, but he called Timothy his son in spiritual nature with God. And Paul likens the fact that he saw between Eunice and he saw in Lois the grandmother and the mother about how they prepared Timothy. They taught him the scriptures. They taught him about God. They taught him about his faith, and they began to empower him. And Paul saw the greatness of what came from that, and he shares that with us in 2 Timothy 1.5. He says, I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you. Paul could see through those two women and through the power of which they had empowered this young man, he said, because of the faith I see in them, I now see that in you. You see, a mother's words, they, they can build up or they can tear down. And that's the next piece of what we see is that a mother loves through her words. A mother loves through her words. Eunice taught Timothy the scripture. She taught him about the faith. She wasn't too busy she didn't look at her vocation as saying that was more important. She didn't say that shopping in the mall was more important. She taught her son the Word of God. Now, it's interesting, our Jewish friends, they actually start teaching children about God at the age of five. And at the age of five, they begin to rear them into the scriptures of the Old Testament, the writings of the prophet, and of the wisdom writings as well. And what a great witness that would be for us. Maybe we as Christians need to adopt that same kind of trend, that, that from that earliest of ages of five, maybe younger, we should be teaching our children about the word of the Lord. Paul continues on in writing in 2 Timothy. He says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and that you have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you have learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise uh, for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. He says that from that early age that he was taught about salvation in Christ, it was through the Holy Scriptures that he got there. He goes on to write that all Scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting. It's used for training in righteousness so that the person of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Do you see the importance of what it is through words? to teach especially our children what it means to have that kind of faith. The biggest legacy that we can leave our children is not our money, it's not our property, 
It's not anything that has to do with this world. The greatest legacy we can leave our children is the character that we had as their parents or as their loved ones or their influencers. And that's why Paul knew Timothy was the right person to anoint and choose because he saw through the character of Eunice, he saw through the character of Lois, and he said, I know the stock from which this young man comes, and I know he will be the one that I will take into the future. A mother's love comes through her touch. That's our last point. Let me tell you the story of a woman by the name of Carolyn Isbister. Carolyn Isbister was a, was a woman who, who actually was um, rushed to the hospital. She had had a bacteria get inside of her system, and she was um, uh, 24 weeks pregnant. And um, at that particular time, the doctor said that there was no way that her child would be viable. And so she's rushed to the hospital, and they're trying to stop the birthing process, but this bacteria that was inside of her body, it would have killed the child, and it would have killed her. So they had to do something. They had to go ahead and induce the labor. They had to take the child from her womb at that very early stage. And the, and the doctors were estimating at that particular time that this baby weighed less than a pound. Now think about that. The viability of less than a pound prematurely in the world. The doctors, the pediatrician, the obstetricians, and all the experts came to her and said, your child just is not going to live. So after you give birth to your child, we're going to give you some quiet time with your little girl. But nothing you can do, nothing that we can do, can save this child. So after the little baby was born, they wrapped her up in swaddling claws, and, and Carolyn held the little baby, and she thought, you know, she looks so cold, and she's turning blue, and her feet were just as cold to the touch. She said, I need to do something, so she unwrapped the cloth, and she put the baby on her chest and bore her chest and kept the baby there in the warmth of her chest, and she just cuddled her. She just kept cuddling her. For two hours, she cuddled this little baby, and the doctors and the nurses kept coming in, waiting for the inevitable to happen, that the child would die. And then after the second hour, the baby began to cry. Her color went from a pale color, went also now to a color that was starting to turn red, like, like blood and oxygen was entering the baby's body. She began to squirm, and, and, and Carolyn continued to just hold her little baby. And afterwards, the pediatrician said, I don't know what happened. All I can tell you is the moment that this mother grabbed her child and brought it to her breast, it was the touch of that mother that restored this child's life. Carolyn said it was greater than that. It was God's power. And she said it wasn't science, it wasn't all those other things, because science would say that this baby should not have lived. She said, I did all I could do. When everybody told me my baby would not survive, I reached out and I grabbed her and I cuddled her close to my body. Eight weeks later, she took young Rachel home, eight pounds the size of a normal child. It's remarkable to think of that. A mother's touch, a mother's touch can demonstrate love. The touch of God through a mother's hand can do so much. So our mothers bring us wisdom. They, they sacrifice to it through love. They, they give us words, and, and through their touch and through all of these things, our boo-boos are healed, our wounds are mended. We're given the words of life, and because of their teaching, we learn about the Lord. You know what? Today is a special day. It's a day we need to thank God for the women and the mothers in our lives who have made a difference for us. So to all of you, thank you. And continue to be the person that God has called you to be and influence the rest of us until the end of the age. Let us pray. Loving God, just come to you today and ask for your anointing. We thank you that what you